attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining. This is the December 28, 2011 webinar of the Council of State Governments Eastern Regional Conference's Health Policy Committee. I'm Ellen Andrews, consultant to the Health Policy Committee, and we're fortunate to have Rosemary Gibson today to talk about the harm of overtreatment in the U.S. health system, the potential benefits and savings from reducing overuse, and what states can do about it. Rosemary Gibson is an author of several books. I looked this up today. It's very impressive. I'm always impressed with people who write books. Someday I, you'll have to tell me how you do that. Um, uh, including The Battle Over Healthcare, What Obama's Reform Means for America's Future, The Wall of Silence, The Untold Story of Medical Mistakes That Kill and Injure Millions of Americans, and The Treatment Trap, How the Overuse of Medical Care is Wrecking Your Health. She is also section editor for the journal The Archives of Internal Medicine. A little housekeeping for this webinar. If you're listening on the phone, remember to input the audio pin that should be visible on your screen if you want to be able to talk and ask questions. We'll be keeping everyone on mute until Rosemary's finished, and then we'll have lots of time for questions. To ask a question, you can either raise your hand by pressing the little raise your hand button, <clears throat> or you can type your questions into the question pane text box on your screen at any point in the webinar. Slides and video of this webinar will be posted online on CSG's website at www.csgeast.org and on the Connecticut Health Policy Project's website. Thanks, and now I will turn it over to Rosemary and also give her slide control. Thank you, Rosemary. Oh, thank you very much, Alan. Good morning. I'm delighted to uh, talk this morning about a really important topic in healthcare and it's what states can do about health care overuse. Just as a little bit of background, I was, um, prior to doing this work, I was at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for 16 years and led our national strategy to bring palliative care into the mainstream of health care, particularly in hospitals. And also, I uh, had the pleasure of working on quality improvement and patient safety work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, along with many other initiatives to make healthcare better and safer for all of us. I'm going to advance to the next slide and get to our topic of the day and the purpose of the presentation. And I'm just pressing down here to advance the slide. And for some reason, let me see here. I'm just trying to advance the slide. I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Maybe Ellen can help. There we go. The purpose of this presentation is to identify three very practical action steps that state legislators and executive branch officials can do. In fact, you can start doing this tomorrow or after the new year to curb overuse, improve quality, and to save state resources. So what is overuse? Overuse is when the potential for harm of a healthcare service exceeds the possible benefit. This is a definition that was developed by the Institute of Medicine back in 1998. And overuse is one of the, what I call one of the three of the holy trinity of quality in healthcare. We have underuse, misuse, and overuse. And we all know what underuse is when people don't get the care they need. Misuse of the errors and infections that occur. And overuse is here when we're actually doing procedures and tests and surgeries where the harm of that healthcare service, again, exceeds the possible benefit. And this, is, uh, this topic is gaining greater currency and visibility in recent years, which is a good thing. I like to say that overuse is coming out of the closet. We have diverse organizations such as Consumer Reports, which is now reporting on overuse. They did a recent analysis of unnecessary cardiac screening tests that online. And so if you're a 45 to 54-year-old male in healthy, good shape with no risk factors and no family history, there are certain screening tests that you really don't need, and chances are the risks are greater than the possible benefit. And consumer Reports will be doing more in this sphere in the coming future. Just last week, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation launched what it's calling a Choosing Wisely campaign for doctors. That's a campaign to 
highlight where we're doing too much. There's a recognition that there are many test procedures and surgeries that are overused, and they have worked are working with physician specialty organizations to identify the top five things that doctors should stop doing or do a whole lot less of. Recently, they came out with an article in the Archives of Internal Medicine, where I'm a section editor, publishing the top five in primary care that we can do less of. Just a few quick examples of what's in that. It's uh, EKGs for healthy uh, patients who have no history of heart disease or risk factors or family history, and doing that annually at a physical, that's simply not uh, appropriate or necessary. Finally, then, another salvo in putting overtreatment out there is the National Priorities Partnership. They identified tests and procedures that are overused. Again, that was done in consultation with physician specialty groups. And so some common overused surgeries are cardiac uh, bypass surgery, prostatectomy, hysterectomy. And if you are interested in knowing more about this list, I would be happy to share that with Ellen and she can circulate that to you. Here's a very practical action step that states can start doing uh, you know, January 2nd. Uh, or just last, uh, or actually earlier this month, the Joint Commission proposed a new national patient safety goal on overuse. And what that proposed national patient safety goal would do is beginning in 2013, every accredited hospital would be required to select a treatment, a procedure, or test where there is clear-cut evidence of overuse. And the Joint Commission identifies some selected areas of overuse. They include early induction of labor where there's no medical reason. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Ear tube surgery in children. Dr. Chasson, who is head of the Joint Commission, has studied this topic extensively and has published on it in the medical literature over many decades, how we're performing ear tube surgery in children in situations that are contrary to the guidelines set out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. This could be an important Medicaid issue. Are we doing unnecessary surgery in children on Medicaid and also even in state employees' health plans? And remember, when there's ear tube surgery, surgery is never routine. There's always the risk with anesthesia. So we have to look at the risks and benefits. Another area of suggested um, coverage of overuse by the Joint Commission are cardiac stents and CT scans. We'll talk more about CT scans in a minute. And again, all of these areas, there's abundant literature showing that we are overusing them, that patients are getting them unnecessarily. So here's what accredited hospitals in your state will have to do. Hospitals will be required under this Joint Commission standard to determine whether overuse is occurring in these or other areas. And beginning in 2014, they will have to work to reduce inappropriate use of at least one procedure or test. So here's an idea. Uh, can states' Medicaid programs encourage hospitals to work to reduce more than one area of overuse identified by the Joint Commission? This could be quite fruitful, and the same could be true of state employees. Now here's an example of one of the items on the Joint Commission list, early induction at birth. This is a quote from a um, hospital um, and a physician there who's been working on reducing early induction at birth. Dr. Donovan says it's now really well documented in national studies that the risk of the baby having to require intensive care in a neonatal intensive care unit, even the risk of infant death, is increased when the baby is born as little as two weeks before the due date. A baby born three weeks early with mature lungs may not be ready to eat because the brain's not fully developed. So what's happening is that we are doing early induction during labor in that crucial 37 to 39 week period. In many cases, and I'll show you some data in a minute, where it's not medically appropriate. In fact, it's highly medically inappropriate. And that leads to very bad outcomes, potentially bad outcomes for the child 
and also higher spending for care for the infant in the NICU. And there's some movement in this direction to work on early induction. In January 2011, the LeapFrog Group issued a press release with data from 773 hospitals on the percent of births that are elective induction or C-section without a medical indication between the 37th completed week and the 39th completed week of gestation. And I took a couple of um, uh, data points. And here's uh, one from Rumford Hospital in Maine where 80% of the uh, early inductions and C-sections were for um, reasons that were not medically necessary. And I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine the LeapFrog group will continue and perhaps they may come out with another updated report. The good news is that we can do something about this. But first, why does this happen? It might be because of physician or patient preference. There's this intervention culture we have now in hospitals that contributes to overuse. And there's a false belief that it is safe to induce birth as early as 36 weeks. There was a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that uh, reported, and this was done in Sweden, but it's applicable everywhere, that early term birth overall, actually, and you know, even at you know, 30 weeks, 32 weeks, they show that there seems to be a relationship between that an increase in mortality in young adulthood among those children who were preterm births. They didn't break out the data for 37 to 39 weeks, but the point being this is serious business and we're doing a practice routinely in hospitals that is harming children, costing a lot of money. And the good news is we can do something about it. Now, this is a quote from the Childbirth Connection organization. My doctor tried to scare me into being induced prior to my due date because, as it turns out, he was going on vacation. That's not a good thing to do. And the good news is there's something else that can be done in your state. In Ohio, doctors in the 20 largest hospitals were asked to document a medical reason every time a woman was scheduled to deliver before 39 weeks. In less than 15 months, the rates of those deliveries drop from 15% to under 5%. And more important, the number of babies admitted to neonatal intensive care also decreased. Better outcomes, better care, reduced costs. This is something that every single state can begin doing if they haven't started already um, you know, tomorrow. So here's an action, related action step. Find out early induction rates in your state's Medicaid program and even perhaps your state employee's plan. Identify the top hospitals with early induction. Maybe have hospitals report. As mentioned, the LeapFrog Group has voluntary reporting from 773 hospitals. You could have reporting in your state of every hospital. And then you can also put incentives in place to reduce early induction without medical necessity. And by the way, I think this information is good not just for people in their policy-making roles, but also for those of us in our family life, in our personal lives, for us to know this information. Another area where the Joint Commission suggested that we should reduce overuse is in um, diagnostic imaging. In the Archives of Internal Medicine, we published this study done by researchers at the National Cancer Institute. That's what NCI stands for. My apologies, I should have spelled it out. NCI researchers estimated that the 70 million CT scans performed in 2007 will cause 29,000 cancers in Americans and 14,500 deaths, and two-thirds of those projected cancers will occur in women. And this is from the radiation exposure that comes with CT scan use. The good news is the National Quality Forum, which develops consensus around performance measures, has endorsed a diagnostic imaging measure of overuse around CT scans. Here's one example. Uh, and it's now actually on Medicare Hospital Compare, and I'll show you in a minute where you can look up hospitals in your state. With a, what's a double CT scan? A double CT scan is when a patient has two imaging tests consecutively, one without contrast material and the other with contrast. And what happens is the patient gets double radiation dose. There's almost unanimous consent that it's absolutely rare that a patient should have both. They should have one or the other, but not both imaging tests. 
Hospital Compare has data for those hospitals that are um, doing well on this measure and those hospitals that are overusing double CT scans. And you can go to the Hospital Compare website. You can type in your zip code, your state, your city, and you can search by hospital. There's actually a, a, an easier function, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, here's a brief recap of what you'll see. Most hospitals use the double chest CT scan sparingly, which is good, but there are 618 hospitals in America where at least 10% of Medicare patients had a double chest CT scan, and that's too high. And even more worrisome, in 94 hospitals, nearly half the patients who had a chest CT scan had a double scan. That's a red flag, and that's much too high. Now, how can you find out hospitals in your state? Better than hospital compare, you can Google, Google double chest CT scans, New York Times, June 17, 2011, and you will get this map. You can see it on the right-hand side, and they have dots. And I, you, I believe that the red dots, dots might indicate, or the orange dots, very high overuse of this particular diagnostic imaging. So what, just briefly, what you can do is tomorrow you can look up your hospital and then you can identify and ask those hospitals that are overusing these CT scans and say, what is it that we can do uh, to reduce them? And actually set a plan and a target. And I presume that Hospital Compare and Medicare will be updating their data so you, you'll be able to check back in months and years to come to see if there's progress on this performance measure. Anyway, uh, to learn more about different types of procedures that are overused and what you uh, can do in a policymaking role and what you can do as a patient and family member, I've written a book called The Treatment Trap. It puts a human face and talks about this issue in a very um, understandable sort of way. We're delighted that the pre uh, president of Consumers Union wrote the forward, um, uh, Jim Guest, and we donate proceeds to patient groups because it's the right thing to do. We have narratives of patients who bore the consequences of unnecessary care. This is an urgent quality issue. And I'll close with my email. And uh, we're just at 20 minutes, which is what Ellen suggested. I'm happy to have a dialogue and conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Well, great, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Um, this has been incredibly helpful. Uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand by clicking the raise your hand button, or you can um, uh, type it into the little sort of Twitter question pane um, on your screen. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to thank you very, very much. This is uh, fascinating information, and I'm going to take um, – an opportunity to, to think about this for a minute. Um, I'm glad you brought up the state employee plans. We talked a little earlier, but I think a lot of legislators and executive branch state policymakers don't recognize that between Medicaid and the state employee plans, those are generally the two very largest um, purchasing pools in your state. And you have a lot of control, not just over paying for it, but you also license every doctor in every hospital in your, uh, in your state, through the state. So you can as Rosemary suggested, there's no, you know, the Joint Commission is requiring that states look at one area, but there's nothing stopping states from requiring that they look at more, either through payment or through licensure. Um, and, you know, the, and Ellen, if I can, sorry, if, Ellen, sure. if I can just jump, can I just jump in on sure, this? I think yeah. it's a really great point. Um, with regard to state employees, some people might think, gee, you're taking something away from me. But if we look at the examples that I've given, the double chest CT scan where you have excess radiation exposure or early induction of labor. Those are two things that have negative consequences. And you'd actually be helping employees and their families if we were doing less of these. And also, they're paying out of pocket, I presume, some deduct perhaps some deductibles and copay. So it becomes expensive. So here's a way that you can actually help employees without a sense that you're taking away anything from them and you're actually helping. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of conversation about overuse of PSA tests, mammograms. I wouldn't go there. I would start with those things where there's absolute consensus in the medical community that we're overdoing it. So I think this is these are some examples of great places to start. And I think um, you know state policymakers have uh, 
the luxury but also the responsibility of taking a larger view. Um, it's not just about whether something's cost effective as it might be for, you know, a, an insurer. But I was really taken by your comment that early induction can have an impact much, much later in life um, as a young adult. Well, those people may not still be in the same insurance company that was charged for their early induction, but they're still probably living in the same state. And those state residents, those kinds of problems, they're going to enter the safety net, the educational system, the other systems in the state that all come out of, you know, your general fund. So states have a much broader view about what's cost effective and what um, it, and what's worth the time and energy um, earlier on. And in terms of investment, return on investment, something that, uh, you know, uh, comes out in terms of development of a young adult um, by just uh, delaying, um, you know, birth for a few weeks. I can't imagine something more cost effective. Um, do you have any uh, states or any sort of examples of systems where, um, you know, that are leading on this? Uh, there is some work in California where they're producing data on variation in rates of different procedures. And as I recall, I think it's, um, it might be uh, hysterectomy rates and other procedures that are very common and are known to be overused. And so, uh, you yeah, this stems from studies, Ellen, as I'm sure you know, that were done by Jack Wenberg uh, years ago in Maine and Vermont that showed enormous variation in prostatectomies and tonsillectomies in mm -hmm. the same state. So in, in Maine, uh, some, there was a figure we have in the treatment trap, the percentage of men over age, what, 80, who had had their prostates removed. It was enormous in some communities and very low in others. And, it, you know, there's, is that good medicine? I think most physicians would agree, probably not. And would patients wonder why, you know, living in one community, people get this care versus others? And in part, it's because physicians don't know the variation that exists. And when they were shown the data, guess what? The physicians that were overdoing these uh, prostatectomies and tonsillectomies dramatically reduced um, the uh, number of procedures they performed. So uh, that's one thing that can be done that's resource intensive to collect data um, by variation. If you have an all-payer system, I believe Maine has that, that's something that you could certainly do mm -hmm. and look at variation across the state. And as from a public point of view, I think that certainly um, is something that is understandable to the ordinary public. Different, uh, say, hysterectomy rates for women. Why is it so high in some communities? And we know that there are alternatives to hysterectomy that leave the uterus intact. Yet in other communities, it's lower. So um, that's one, um, one area where states have been um, taking action on overuse. Right. I, I'm glad you bring up the all-payer systems because that is something that a lot of our states are looking at. Um, several of our states actually have or, um, either in development or actually are using, including Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, are working on all-payer systems to track outcomes and, um, and uh, treatments. And so this is a, a fantastic, I mean, what do you use those systems for once you build it? This is exactly the kind of use that that um, can be used for in developing policy. Um, I'm also thinking about links, uh, links to performance measures in payment reform. Most states are looking at payment reform. That's certainly a, a huge piece of the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. nationally. And it's linking payment to value. Well, we're going to start defining value, and a lot of it has been process-related, you know, doctors getting electronic medical records and that kind of stuff. But those processes are not any good unless they improve people's health. And this is a, um, to link it to this kind of performance in reducing overuse um, could actually improve people's health. Uh, and I, and I, like you said, it's something we could do tomorrow. Uh, on a, that uh, stimulates a thought, Ellen, that recent data came out uh, showing the huge variation in antibiotic prescribing by state. Kentucky and West Virginia were at the top. I'd have to go back and look and see where New England states were. But um, you could circulate that, um, that data. Yeah. And if New England states are in the top tier, if any of them are, that's absolutely an area that needs redressing because overuse of antibiotics 
is um, makes the next generation of antibiotics much more difficult to develop. Right. Uh, they simply won't work. Uh, so um, that's a, a very practical step if any of the uh, people in the community that are listening and others who will see this online are interested in knowing more about. Right. Well, this has been fantastic. It doesn't look like we have any questions, but I want to thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, and again, she has generously given us her contact information. She will regret that. Um, but I want to thank you very, very much. And if you have any questions, please um, contact Rosemary or you can contact me. Thank yeah, you please very don't much. hesitate. Yeah, there's no there's no question that should go unanswered. Uh, there's no foolish question. This is a whole new area that all of us have to learn about in our personal lives and our professional lives. And it's a great way to have a sustainable healthcare system while also providing good care to people. Great. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ellen. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.